Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Sustainable After, an interview series brought to you by Lumish, a Swiss investment management firm. So the year 2020 was supposed to be the year of fashion sustainability. However, now the world is facing a pandemic. Over the last years, we at Lumish have engaged with hundreds of fashion tech startups. We, had wor we have worked with international brands. We have worked with lots of investors in the arena. And all of that mainly through our Fashion Innovation Award platform. Our particular focus lately has been on fashion sustainability, which is one of the many areas that have suffered a serious coronavirus impact. So that's why we are bringing in this weekly plan panel discussions. And in those, our goal is to explore the ways in which COVID-19 crisis could actually serve as a catalyst for, for positive change in fashion. Each week, we will be hosting conversations with entrepreneurs, brands, investors, and opinion leaders working in and around sustainability. Many of them took part in the sustainability edition of our Fashion Innovation Award. My name is Yara Natasic, and I wish you all a very warm welcome to the first episode. Today, I'm humbled uh, by the presence of three um, remarkable founders who are joining us from different European countries. So let me present them to you. Dr. Hyman Hihosa, founder and chief creative and innovation officer of Ananasanam. So years ago, Carmen created Pinatex, the innovative natural material made from pineapple leaf fiber which serves as a replacement for leather. So far, Pinatex has been used by over 1,000 brands worldwide, including Hugo Boss, H&M, and so on. It is a pleasure to have you with us today, Carmen. Thank you. Joining us from Amsterdam, Tony Toaner, uh, the founder uh, and the king of inspiration, as he says, at the Kings of Indigo, uh, the new fashion brand. So since its launch in 2011, Kings of Indigo's collections have been designed with sustainability in mind when it comes to garment durability, material sourcing, and the approach to the supply chain. Looking at it from the outside, um, I'd say that Kings of Indigo stands from one of those smaller brands that are actually the mighty ones, that are those that are leading the denim industry and showing them how things could be done in a different way. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today, Tony. Pleasure for me too. And the last, but uh, not, the, not the least, Giulio Cesare, um, CEO and founder of Directa Plus. Um, so Giulio is an Italian entrepreneur uh, who founded Directa Plus back in 2005 over in the US. Uh, and his goal was to start engineering and manufacturing carbon nanoparticles called graphene, but in a sustainable way. Uh, today we can say that Directa Plus production in Italy is the world's biggest sustainable graphene plant in the world. So graphene mains applications in the apparel industry is with tex textiles that need to, to have increased durability, increased performance. And for example, they recently did a project with Colmar using their materials. Um, but there are also some other major applications in other industries that Julia is going to tell us about. Uh, welcome, it's great to have you with us, Julia. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. So um, let's start with the first question that I'm going to address to, to all of you. So could you explain what your organization does and in what specific ways it relates to tackling fashion sustainability issues? Would you like to start, Carmen? Yes, thank you. Yes. So Anwar Salam has developed a new material made from pineapple leaf fibers, which is the waste from the pineapple harvest. As such, what we are doing in the company is we're valorizing waste, we're giving employment to some of the poorest farming communities in the agricultural community using circular economy principles. Uh, so Pinatex is used in the fashion industry as an alternative to leather and petroleum-based textiles. So as such, we are bringing a sustainable solution to a very wasteful and unsustainable industry, really. And this is the main value of Pinatex. How about you, Tony? Uh, yeah, I'm Tony and I'm the founder of King's Vindigo and uh, King's Vindigo uh, from the start uh, has a, a, a vision of uh, working in the most sustainable way possible uh, as a holistic approach. Um, we're using five pillars to uh, to make sure that uh, that uh, we focus on the right things uh, and to make a fair and clean product. 
Um, we're working with the five pillars like uh, raw materials. Uh, we work on uh, water management. We work on uh, social fairness. We work on uh, carbon and uh, transport. Uh, let's say car carbon footprint minimization on transport and energy. And we work on uh, product projects where we can uh, work on reutilization uh, of materials and uh, circular economy. Uh, we make uh, mainly uh, uh, jeans and jeans related products and sportswear. So we have a full apparel collection as well, uh, but always around the basis of jeans, uh, including accessories, some kids' jeans, uh, always um, inspired by American classics. And um, the Japanese uh, eye for detail. So we mix those two, those two denim cultures, premium denim cultures into one and do it in a sustainable way. And that's uh, Kins of Indigo or Koi in short. I see it's a wonderful case study in the denim industry. Um, Thank you. Julia, would you, would you like to tell us a little bit more about, um, about your company? Yes, uh, uh, um, my name is Julia Cesaro. I founded the Director Class in 2005 uh, out of a green field. Uh, the idea was really to build a, a new uh, production plant uh, to generate carbon nanoparticles. At that time, the word graphene was not so sexy, so we were talking about the carbon nanoparticles in a simple, in a scalable, but is also in a sustainable way. And uh, what we did uh, was really to develop an idea uh, of one of my partners, an, an American scientist, uh, to uh, produce nanoparticle working just with physics and with no chemistry at all. And this is the core of our uh, sustainability, uh, as well as the fact that we uh, utilize 100% of the raw material. The yield in our production input is 100, the output is, is 100%. The fact that we are not using chemistry uh, opens us uh, immediately the door of the textile verticals. We are now in four main verticals. The first one is environmental and I hope I will have a chance to cover it very quickly. The second is textile, uh, where we are pretty well, with pretty well positioned uh, all, all over the entire industry from uh, uh, the natural uh, to uh, the synthetic uh, material and uh, elastomer and, and composite. So, and even in composite, we just launched uh, an, an asphalt uh, that uh, can stay uh, three times longer on, on the road. We will triple the life of the road just because of the presence of this nanoparticle. And in the textile industry, well, what kind of material is that? Uh, in the textile, uh, we have two or three different uh, uh, solutions. Uh, the first one is what we define planar femur circuit. We are printing uh, uh, inside uh, uh, the garments a kind of, of real circuit and we transform uh, uh, the garment into an intelligent, an intelligent material taking advantage of the body temperature. If it's uh, uh, warm, uh, with the move of air, we can uh, uh, increase the sense of comfort because for the first time, we can manage the temperature of the body not to plane, but in plane. So from the hot spot in the body, we move to the cold part of the body. And uh, by just by uh, generating a little delta of temperature, we uh, uh, pass a significant sense of comfort. So in, in, in warm climate, with air moving in and out, we, we reduce the temperature. In winter time, if we put uh, uh, in front of our uh, planar thermal circuit uh, an insulation, uh, we will keep the heat inside, inside the body. Uh, we will move the heat from the hot to the cold area. And uh, like in um, uh, uh, scuba, scuba suit. <laughs> Very, very interesting. Um, you'll be you'll be able to tell us a little bit more later on about other projects that um, that you are doing. Um, so going a little bit uh, further, kind of in a bit deeper into um, the impact on sustainability of what you are doing. 
So Carmen, I've noticed that over the years, Pinatex has collected a number of awards, especially when it comes to material innovation. So among else, it is also a PETA certified vegan fashion label and sound. So could you put in perspective on a, on a larger scale, the role that these alternative materials could play for big brands on the, their way uh, to sustainable fashion? Because what I see from as, as an outsider in a way to the industry is that, um, it's very, it's quite, it's fairly easy to start a fashion brand from scratch. But how do we help the big brands to get more sustainable on the go? Yes, um, I think everything starts with a material. So um, the first stage of any product is a material. And to have a sustainable material, a transparent supply chain is the good basis to develop any sustainable product and I think Pinatex is, is quite at a good point uh, because it's considered by experts really in the um, in the market as the best alternative to leather and synthetic materials in terms of product choice in terms of volume and properties uh, at the scaling potential which is really important but also the environmental and the social impact um, and I think for these reasons, uh, we are playing, or rather our product, Pinatex, is playing a pivotal role in helping brands to be becoming more sustainable. And the way I see this is that, you know, they're huge brands, most of them are big, they cannot move and change really fast. So the way they can really do it is by linking with smaller companies. We are, we can be faster, we can be very flexible, we can really mm -hmm. connect to see and we can share the value of the relationship, but also we can share our values, our vision, and transform it into something that can really be put out there into the public, uh, a bigger public that we would have ourselves. Okay, could you give us an example the, of a project you did with a brand? Um, we did one with uh, Hugo Boss, which was very successful and really based on a sustainable product that they developed. They were, the first one was a pair of sneakers, uh, sports shoes. Uh, they use Pinatex in the upper, but they also use uh, natural rubber. They use organic cotton. So they really made an effort and they really do to develop the, a product, take into account the 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 grouping of other materials to make it as sustainable as possible. Um, it takes quite a long time. It took about two years to develop this, but it was really done in depth. It was really done from the beginning, right? Uh, you know, all the research, all the chemicals, everything. And it is a very exciting, complex and wonderful way to work. Um, but we learned a lot about this. Uh, it was really very good for us. And um, the good thing is that the collaboration continues. We did another collection, there's another one coming on. Now it's more men and women. And it really is a pleasure to work with companies that even if they are at that higher level, they are really trying very hard to do the best they can to become sustainable, yeah. even more sustainable. Yeah, also what I'm getting from some other startups is that uh, uh, lots of positive feedbacks about Hugo Boss and the way the ways that they are embracing innovation, but like materials innovation equally as tech innovation as well. Um, so it's not the, the first time I, I, I hear a positive comment about the way they're approaching it. Um, Julia, could you say, so I, I saw that just recently you, um, Director Plus, um, got is a part of one million EU sponsored initiative to develop digital printing methods using graphene. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, and also uh, go a bit deeper into what graphene introduction to fashion textile could mean for garment sustainability. So is it just the way it is produced? Is it also, uh, so how does it play um, down the, the, the product life? So how, how sustainable is it? Yeah. And what are the benefits in respect of like mainstream materials? Okay, let, let's let's start uh, uh, to cover you know the potential impact on sustainability. Uh, uh, graphene is an enabling technology, so uh, we would be in a position to add properties that are not part, originally part of 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 the the, the, the material or, or or the textile. Um, I mentioned before, you know what. Uh, uh, 
is uh, one of our key pillars in textile, the planar thermal circuit, but uh, the real advantage uh, for uh, the environment is uh, the antibacterial property of our material uh, that drastically reduce the need to wash garments. And, and once again, in, in, in line with what Tony for sure will, will cover, the water management is key, is key in this area. If we can reduce you know, the, the number of liter utilized to wash drastically, it's, it's a, a significant advantage. The digital printing initiative uh, is quite interesting uh, because uh, the goals are several, but the main points are uh, the proper uh, grade of graphene. We are trying to develop the right grade of graphene. Graphene is a, 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 a very simple uh, layer of material, you know, like, like a piece of paper where in, in our case, you know, the nano side is the thickness, and then we have the A and B dimension. So uh, to maximize and to take the advantage of digital printing, we have to define the A and B dimension properly, and uh, uh, we have to design with uh, the support of partners, so they will design the new printing head uh, for, for graphene. In this way, we will be able to uh, uh, drastically reduce the printing cost, and to print different circuits for different applications. If you're walking in, in the wood, you, you, you need to control your thermal body a, a, in a certain way. If you're a cyclist, there is a different way. So th this is the real, the real value of uh, uh, the printing initiative. And could you tell us a bit more about the initiative you did with Colmar? Well, yes, uh, with Colmar, I started with Colmar a really long time ago. Uh, Giulio Colombo decided to trust in, in, in our idea and, and concept, and uh, uh, they launched uh, several capsule collections, mainly winter jackets, uh, with inside our thermal circuit, and also uh, some very interesting follow for golf application. And um, we, we, are, we are still working and analyzing all the different opportunities and uh, um, I don't want uh, uh, really to disclose any, any confidential conversation with, with Colmar, but nowadays, and probably we will cover later talking about COVID, the real uh, main issue uh, probably in the, in the fashion arena will be, you know, the antibacterial and antiviral properties. And we are really working deeply on the antiviral side. Mm. No, that's, uh, that's a great aspect of this conversation that we will come to later. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to, to, to tackle another aspect with, um, with Tony. So Tony, with, uh, with Koi, in less than a decade, actually, you have managed to make a very impressive brand with international presence and, uh, and with the brand that walks the talk in a way. Um, so you have the social and environmental sustainability in mind, but you're not compromising quality. So what role, if you could tell us, has innovation played? So both in materials, but also from the digital space in that process? Uh, huge, I think. I mean, if I look at uh, when I started with uh, Kuichi and we developed our first organic uh, quality denim from Europe uh, with uh, Tavix, the quality was okay, but uh, not great. And I think when I left Guichi and we started with King's Vinigo, uh, the getting organic denim products was already pretty easy. So, I mean, that has really been a, a, a big innovation, I think, in, in that business. Uh, when we started with King's Vinigo, actually, our biggest ambition was to use less cotton, because still cotton, even though it's organic, uses a lot of water. And uh, uh, so we are trying to, uh, to actually use alternative materials. Like, uh, of course, recycled cotton is a big, uh, big uh, material. There's a lot of uh, waste in the world, uh, old garments or overproduction, uh, dead stock, uh, but also industrial waste, of course. So we've been focusing a lot on uh, using more and more recycled cotton. Uh, and uh, our, our ambition actually is in a couple of years. Uh, we say 2025 is for sure, but to be honest, I'll, I'll love to do it early, is to, to use no virgin cotton anymore. It's also not organic cotton. So, uh, and then replacing it completely with uh, recycled cotton, uh, man-made fibers like tencel or hemp or linen, mm -hmm. uh, recycled polyester, uh, recycled wool, 
uh, like, but also like uh, materials like peanuts, I think is a very interesting fabric as well, which we could use in our leather patches or other products, accessories. So I think, yeah, I think uh, we, innovation is huge. And I think, especially on the material part, uh, well, like Carmen said, uh, we also start, we have two things where we start with this, uh, with of course the theme of Koi is America, Japan. So we never have a seasonal theme, so we don't need to come up with like uh, short-term themes. We always have a long-term theme, which is Japan and America, and combine the both, which is quite easy to do in denim. Uh, and then we start with fits and fabrics. What fabrics do we have which are the most sustainable we want? Uh, uh, the base fabrics, so which we can we reuse, which do really well and also are uh, highly effective in saving water, or energy, or chemicals. And what new fabrics do we want to use and, and uh, launch and uh, find a good balance between those. And uh, then we take our best fits and maybe we launch one, two new fits and that's it. So uh, also uh, we also try to stay away from uh, turning around styles and uh, uh, too quickly. People, mm -hmm. the ambition is that people buy high quality garment which they can wear for five years or 10 years or whenever they're bored of it, they can sell it second hand at a good price. Mm -hmm. So that's our, has been our vision. And, and if you look at this, this technology development, like I, I can name a few, for example, we just launched with Kanyani uh, Regen gene, which is 50% uh, refibra and 50% recycled cotton. There's no virgin cotton. So more or less, this is our mm -hmm. ambition in 2025. We've, we've managed it now. And also it's a salvage fabric, which is high quality. It's made in Italy and it's also unwashed. And uh, like uh, Julio said, uh, water management, of course, is very important for us. And I love to sell as many unwashed garments as possible because, it, first, first of all, it's an undamaged garment. A washed garment is more or less like a, a worn-in damaged garment, which it artificially does. Um, the, the reality is at the moment, most people want to buy a worn look. So uh, there, if you look at technology, of course, laser and ozone wash has been really important in the, in the past five years. And also the quality, when I started with King's Window, the laser washes looked horrible. They looked very fake, straight lines, very uh, ugly contrast. And uh, to be honest, I, I, I couldn't really use it. The first uh, quality came from LAT and Martelli in uh, Italy, actually, which uh, it, Italians, of course, always are quite upfront on uh, innovation and uh, the textile mm -hmm. industry and also on the sustainability part. Uh, although uh, most Italians started a little bit late, they really caught up and I think uh, they really uh, are very uh, uh, leaders in, in innov innovation and of course also with Tonello and uh, Gina Loggia from uh, Spain, I think we have managed to, to decrease the water use in, in washing the, the garments and also chemical use in washing the garments and energy use to, to not to a minimum because I think innovation will be important for the next few years to keep getting results better and getting lower and lower impact uh, so it's, it's this has been really important and also in the dyeing i think uh, there's new techniques from royo where it's powder dyeing there's no water used at all i think uh, kanyani uses the ketosan of ketotex uh, technique to uh, to have uh, less water used uh, less chemicals used uh, so there's indigo juice from kanyani which uses water use in washing so I think that this technology is the, is the future of sustainability. And I think uh, when people uh, looked at sustainability 10 years ago, they looked at, ah, this is only for the hippies, for the few, few eco warriors, and it's not cool, it's not fashionable. And if you look at sustainability as innovation, it's, uh, it's almost like a tech company. It's, it's so cool mm -hmm. how, what, is, what has happened in the past years in all these uh, different areas. Because with Kwich, I couldn't even find the organic cotton denim fabric. You know, we had to buy cotton in Uganda. I had to ship it myself to Spain, get it to Tavex, spin it, uh, weave it, and then ship it to Tunisia for production. And now all mills, uh, last week was uh, Kingpins, and Kingpins uh, managed to get like an, uh, an online version, like with Zoom as well, uh, a trade show online which is quite unique as well if you look at from a sustainable point of view no people traveling all yeah. to amsterdam and still uh, being able to show their products i think is quite an inspiration for a lot of other trade shows of brands and fabrics and i think uh, it was, was very interesting to see what uh, what uh, what is possible then you know so for me yeah. yeah this is the future i love innovation uh, to, to be really honest i love denim but if I wouldn't work on a sustainable side, I would have been bored out of my skull already of this because it's making the same over and over. And I think what makes my work and my, my life fun that every year there's so much, much newness. And, and if you have this hunger and also passion to develop new stuff, then sustainability gets in a completely different light 
And also for designers, you don't have to force them anymore to use it like it because a lot mm -hmm. of companies still top down, the CEO decide, oh, we have to be more sustainable because uh, apparently it's happening. And, and I think there, uh, like Carmen also said, like in bigger company also, it's really being implemented, but also young designers and fashion students, there's so much into this subject that is not being like, oh, we have to do this. No, it makes your work so much more fun. And I think that's also for consumers to learn that if you buy something more sustainable, you also you're, means you're a little bit more interested in what you buy. So buy less, but buy better and be passionate about the garment you wear. It's your new, it's your new best friend. And if you look at it like that, I think then also we can consume less. And that's, of course, the first thing we have to do instead of producing 180 billion garments a year, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, what you're what you saying is uh, it's really what I think that we see across the, across the value chain of fashion is that um, overall people are getting more aware. So consumers are getting more aware, but also as you see students, but also CEOs of big companies and so on. And there is, a, there is this um, momentum somehow that I felt was being created, especially towards the end of last year, uh, where it uh, became not only necessary in a way, but also cool. Uh, to uh, and that was the point as you were saying a point that was uh, that was missing for decades probably um, the yeah in the, the beginning also we with Koichi we never really managed on the on front that we were organic or we were working with uh, made by uh, to get our social standards or SA 1000 because people thought it was not cool mm. and uh, so we, we decided like uh, to communicate at the inside of the garment but never on the outside of the garment so also to get a lot of unaware people unaware uh, like, like unconscious people unconsciously conscious and then <laughs> they found out and I think now it becomes almost the other way around that yeah. it becomes like a marketing tool which is also dangerous because I see so much bullshit, there's so much greenwashing everywhere. We have mm. to, consumers have to be careful that they don't buy a marketing story, which is not true. So, uh. yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's getting more complex, if anything. Yeah. Um, uh, I would. I would like now to, to to kind of come back a little bit to to the current situation that we are all living here in uh, in Europe, but also all over the world. So. The outbreak of COVID has uh, has halted the world economy, and it is likely to affect fashion like in an unprecedented way, like like never before. Um, so we have seen massive store closures, but also uh, looking from a personal perspective, we are all in lockdown. There is nowhere to go, and uh, um, like nobody feels like buying clothes or the need to buy clothes or any. Um, any garments um, so uh, I'd like to, to learn more a little bit of uh, how you see this situation from where you sit in the fashion industry how has it impacted your uh, affected your business plans this year like how, how do you how do you see it um, for the time being would you tell us a bit more Carmen perhaps oh, yes of course sorry and <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the fashion industry, as we know, is, is in totally red alert at the moment. Uh, we know that it is really going to be a financial and humanitarian crisis. Uh, you know, we develop our own supply chain from scratch, and this is really, really uh, the biggest reality for us uh, to make sure that everybody is right, that we can help, you know, from the beginning, or rather from the beginning, which is the farming communities, these cooperatives that we're working with to the end. Uh, but also the other reality is that you know revenues are going to go down uh, our as a small company we are really in a very vulnerable situation ourselves um, this crisis a pandemic has affected basically our sales our production our supply chain uh, our projections obviously for this year have gone really down dramatically um, and it's such a wake up call. In fact, I was just coming from the Philippines. I just managed to get out of the Philippines seeing I'm coming back with so much enthusiasm, love for everything and everybody, you know, meeting all these cooperatives that we're working with. And I just managed to get out of Manila two days before they locked down. And then I went all the way to Dubai, to Madrid. I got out of Madrid. I'm actually in Spain at the moment with my family because I couldn't get back to London. So oh. it's a wake up call to realities which are such different realities um, and you know every dramatic movement brings transition and brings solutions 
And it's interesting because when I went to the Philippines, I had a very specific mission to do, which was I was starting a new journey, which was my personal journey um, to go back to the source because it's five years that Pinatex is in the market. But, you know, building up a company is really hard. You lose a bit touch with the reality of where you're coming from. And I thought this is my time to go back to link with the source, to really feel body and soul the reality. And I came back and this was the reality. And I feel that uh, this connection, body and soul, with this new reality, with what really matters, is for everybody today. Um, this journey had a name, which I'm going to tell you because I think it's quite an interesting name. Uh, I used a Tagalog, which is the language of the Philippines, Tagalog name, which is Kaluluwa. Kaluluwa means soul in Tagalog. And the journey that to me I started, and I think is everybody's journey really, is Kaluluwa, the Pina takes journey to the soul. And I think this is the journey we need to engage today. You know? Now, yeah. just so what you're saying, what you're living at the moment is also part of that journey, although you didn't plan it. Totally. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. I see. I see. Mm. Julia, how about yourself? So you, you live very close to the one of the, let's say, worst uh, hit areas in Italy. Mm. Yes, uh, um, um, unfortunately, and we are ready to, to move into phase two, but nobody knows what is going, what is going to happen. You know, from my perspective, uh, uh, I'm, I'm asking uh, uh, my sales and marketing team to uh, stay focused uh, at least on free market uh, uh, forces, you know. The first one, to understand, you know, in, in segments, you know, uh, where which segment will start first uh, and uh, we are lucky here because uh, you mentioned before Colmar but one of our uh, uh, best uh, partners uh, is uh, Alfredo Grassi who is uh, a, a leader in protective wear and we expect that protective wear will 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 move on faster than any than anybody else then we would like to understand the needs and, and, and demand and demand you know what really customer wants in, in in the future if i will go next week into the tube in in, in milan and, and somebody uh, call for knees uh, in, in 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 the area in the very close area i don't want to go back home and wash my jacket so again we have to be ready with the the, the properties of our material uh, to support uh, in the right way the textile industry and last but not least you know switching cost you know i i expect uh, uh, that customer will switch from one brand to to the other uh, accordingly to the properties and let's hope that they will choose in terms of sustainability because despite sustainability we suffer a little bit is still in the mind of the young people of the investors so we'll we'll we'll, we'll move on with, without in, any doubt and uh, and i hope you will give me chance later to cover with more detail i think that in trouble time you know also the ethical approach is is key you know and uh, back to cost you know i saw companies here in italy switching to mass production and they are selling masks at, at a crazy price that there's no sense taking advantage mm -hmm. of, of these prices you know leader uh, to be the right leader in the new uh, era uh, surviving with covid means also to have a strong uh, ethical approach yes. would you would you like to tell us a little bit more about how so i've really followed your story over the last few months and uh, how you really reacted with a great degree of agility in this crisis. And uh, so I saw Director Plus people um, producing new fully certified masks and looking into the back to work scenario and so on. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, you know, uh, what, what we did is uh, uh, 
12th of March, I wrote a letter to the Italian Prime Minister offering him our technology and our production unit to fight against COVID. This was based on an emotion, you know, uh, and nothing else because we had no, 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 no experience. And we start to work on uh, an idea uh, that we named Emergency COVID, you know, not, not, not a very original name, but the entire organization uh, is, is working on this project uh, to produce mainly mask in a certain way with certain properties uh, we have not yet uh, uh, received the full certification but we have a clear idea of what we will have to do uh, in terms of, of the mask we are working on protective wear uh, we are developing uh, you know we have a membrane treated with graphene which could be very very interesting uh, for protective wear uh, uh, all, 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 the, all the different areas and the mask we are trying to, in, to engineer and, and uh, I decided this time to work with everybody, you know, in, in a crisis environment, you don't have to choose or select. I thought everybody in textile is, is welcome to talk, to talk with us. We will try, we will test uh, their product, uh, we will put graphene on it, we will test uh, the antibacterial properties. And Tony, by the way, we discovered that they need as fantastic antibacterial properties with graphene on, on, on it, which are quite, quite, quite interesting. So we made more than 60 tests, uh, and now we are able to choose and to proper engineer a mask that will be designed for the back to work and the back to sport. Uh, because no way that we will have to survive this uh, and uh, try to, to, to start our normal life, but, you know, in a completely different environment, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tony, how about yourself? So how, how are you living this crisis as a person and as a brand? Uh, as a person, it's, yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite a interesting. I mean, uh, of course, we were, uh, like you said last in the, in the previously, is that uh, sustainability was on the, on the way of really becoming uh, a, a trend and becoming uh, a more uh, familiar with the consumers and with brands. And uh, a lot of people were diving into this with good or with relatively good intentions. And, uh, but I mean, this, this, this period of course has uh, forced brands to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. And also for us, of course, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, see, we all work from home, which is also quite nice sometimes. You learn, yes, but I spend more time with my kids. I have to school them. I see what they learn at home and uh, which is quite interesting. So as a person, uh, it's not too bad. We are technologically, we were pretty well set up. So we could, because we travel a lot, we are, we were able to work from everywhere already and have all our data central, et, et cetera. So there was, there was no problem. Um, if you look at the yeah, biggest problem, of course, is uh, first of all, the stores closed, right? Uh, end of March to early April. Uh, I think only uh, in the Netherlands, a few stores were open in Sweden, where still, still stores were open. For the rest, all stores in Europe were, were closed. Uh, same for Australia and also, also later, of course, United States and Canada. Uh, but um, so yeah, there was no sales. There was no deliveries anymore. There were no reorders. Uh, online was also going back to almost zero in the first few mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, I have to say since Easter, it has picked up. So I have to say the online turnover is, is it back to uh, our business plan, I would say. Oh. Not back to, so that's above to last hear. year, we had planned growth for online. So that, that's quite okay. Uh, but of course, not compensating uh, your loss in sales in, in your uh, retail. We have 350 stores who are selling our product worldwide. And uh, of course, if most of them are closed, your, your sales will drop. Um, also, our factories are closed. Uh, I think um, uh, now all factories are closed. India is closed. Uh, we work mainly in, uh, in the Mediterranean. So Italy, uh, Greece, uh, Tunisia, uh, Turkey. Uh, a little bit in Portugal and a little bit in Spain, but I mean uh, it's 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 all closed. So yeah, I mean for from that part it's it's uh, disastrous. There's there's no supply. Of course, the summer goods were delivered, mm -hmm. uh, so we have them in our warehouse. Uh, not everything has been delivered because also some uh, the funny thing is that quite some bigger customers they cancel the first, mm -hmm. and the small customers they take the goods maybe at a small discount or like that bigger larger payment term. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, then at least they take the goods. 
but of course as a, as a business is challenging you know it's like the mm -hmm. cash flow is drying up there's nobody's paying anymore because if the stores are not open they don't pay uh, or they pay slow and uh, that that also has an effect on uh, what you have to pay yourself to your suppliers we also uh, we also are very close contact with all our retailers to also communicate like hey guys uh, yeah the, we are if if you say we're all in this together realize that from the cotton farmer to the weaver to the factory to the laundry to the to the agent to us everybody is in, in it together and we all have to keep the money flowing even though it's slower and maybe uh, it's, it's it's a little bit in a different way but uh, let's if we don't want to kill uh, people with uh, less chances than we all have uh, make sure that you pay your bills and uh, so that uh, that that has been uh, quite interesting uh, and also uh, has really strengthened our relationship with the retailers as well. And uh, the funny thing, of course, and which is maybe not surprising, that most of the real eco diet, the real eco stores there, of course, have a different mentality normally than the, the, the bigger department stores who have a bigger cost, but also big, bigger risks. No, I mean it is uh, what I uh, what what I'm perceiving is that although. From a personal perspective, I'm looking at the crisis and I'm thinking it's really we need it to stop. So it's yeah. in a way it's good. It's a good. But then the catch reset. is how do we bridge the the fact that we need it to stop and really supporting people kind of get at the at the other end of the tunnel. Um, so it's difficult that people are also a little bit in survival mode. I think businesses are in survival mode. Consumers are in survival mode. Do I keep my job? so uh and what's going to happen with my financial situation uh, so i think yeah i think as i see this this crisis resulting in two two developments i think one will be people were already thinking about more sustainable consumption consuming less and uh maybe eating less meat uh, driving less kilometers or going taking a train don't fly for 29 euros to barcelona for a weekend to party uh, to just consume a little bit less and and with more consciousness uh, but also don't realize that people are losing their jobs this summer and like if you look at the states what's happening it's like 25 million people lost their job they're going to different mode mode they don't have time to think about sustainability i think and yeah. realize that this summer will be the biggest sale since world war ii i think because there's so much overstock with so many companies that also there will be big discounts and people who don't have less so much money to spend or have uh, feel the risk of the financial instability in their in a personal situation they will be very uh, tempted to buy in sale for at very low prices so that's i think that's the other end yeah. of the tunnel so it's it's almost polarizing more than it already was in this area i'm not sure your country but in holland is quite polarized the climate discussion is quite polarized here there's people really for it and there's also really people against it mm. and i'm really curious how, how this this crisis if this will be more a, a unifying event or it will even polarize more i, I don't I, I, it's hard to predict for me. Yeah. i mean it's um uh, it's very political as well in a way yeah um yeah. carmen are you you put I read the letter that you wrote to your um, to your employees and to to your friends recently uh, on the topic of um, of this crisis and how it um, how it impacts sustainability. And I really like the way that um, that, that you phrase it, uh, saying like as the old ways give way to the yet unknown future. So let's uh, let and there are lots of people speaking about going back to the new normal. And speaking of polarization, there are many people saying like, let's not go back to any normal. So let's re rediscuss and reset the values uh, because this is the the chance. Um, so when when you're thinking about the best possible scenario, um, so for yourself as a person, but also for Pinatex as a company. So Anna um, what what do you see? How do you envision it? Yeah, this this new normal. It's really you know, I, I say new normal and I say the future is now. Uh, really, it, it is the time to, to think to think so globally in a way. You know, we have to think about ourselves and how we can affect the world. And I think um, ourselves, I, you know, at the different levels, we've got the best scenario for this new normal for us, honestly, would be today to really um, have, this is the bell from my little town. You probably can hear that. <laughs> there is one starting here. 
lovely. We don't hear that in London. So, <laughs> so this is the longest one. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, me day. But it's kind of nice. Uh, so the best scenario would be that you know our manufacturing plants, our supplier, fiber suppliers, they're really back at work every month. And you know the next month that will be really what we would hope would become, so we can really kick start everything. Uh, but more than ever, than ever, the new normal for us, which we're really practicing every day, is to give top, 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 sorry, top priority to, to the welfare of, of everybody in the Pinatech supply chain. Um, you know, we're trying from our farming communities uh, to see how they can really keep getting uh, their money, uh, trying to get uh, loans from government to whatever, because, you know, working in places like the Philippines, the social welfare is basically non-existent. So it's really quite difficult. So this is kind of the priority, you know, apart from the financial, how can we really uh, take care of, of the people? Because they are the future with us as well. Um, but I think another thing is that um, it should be, as I think Tony said, that um, we, we just have to stop, you know, fashion has to really stop stimulating this kind of consumption today that, that is absolutely ridiculous. We can't really go on with that. We just need to change. Uh, and as consumers, we really need to take full responsibility for our purchasing behavior. Uh, again, of course, you know, uh, buy less, buy better quality um, and last care for you things as Tony just said and I think the new normal will really bring new collaborations we really have to get together stronger and um, within the industry we think everywhere you know as the thinking process uh, we need to share strategies data we need to share really humaneness I mean, this is very important how can we really care because without this uh, you know it really doesn't matter. How can we care together better for, for, for people and the earth? Uh, and one thing that we are already starting in this new way is to really link ourselves with like-minded people. We're starting an association which has been there in the background for a while, but now it's really it's called the Fibral Association and it's really to connect all the companies that are using uh, waste uh, from agriculture as the raw material, uh, again, is to, to share, to sustain, uh, to, to, to really help each other, to have a um, bond to be, to say to the market, here we are, because we are really new, you know, it, it, this is a new thing, this new kind of products, you've got the wool association, linen association, so what about the fibral association? So I really think this is the new way, again, to, to really work together, link together, care more, uh, and really, you know, be very, very optimistic uh, and, and see the future as, as a new door for opportunities, really. Yeah, um, yeah really, I really like the, um, your point about working together in new ways and putting new partnerships together that were not, not in sight because uh, we have unfortunately seen that the old ways have worked up to a point. So, Bringing slowly our discussion to, to a closure and coming back to the main point um, of this series, which is how we could possibly use this situation to drive positive change in, in fashion. So we have heard over the last few months some really worrying voices. And as Tony was saying before, um, now we are in a standby. The moment people will start uh, shopping, the stores open and go on discount. Um, let's speak again about overconsumption because everybody who has money will go, go on a shopping spree. Uh, so um, how do we ensure that um, this situation doesn't set back um, all the sustainability effort that has been done so far? Um, so how do we ensure that uh, that does that that does not happen? Um, so, Julio, from your perspective, what, what what will be the main thing? Well, I I, I think that you know uh, we will have to work close together. Uh, to, we will have to be humble and listen. You know the people's fear first. First of all, you know I think you know, I'm, I'm trying to elaborate on, on very very interesting concept that Carmen uh, uh, covered. No doubt the pandemic uh, will focus uh, a lot of attention on air. And uh, there is a direct correlation between air and environment. It's, re it's really strong. <clears throat> and uh, we will have really to uh, keep 
the focus and deliver the value that is correlated uh, uh, to sustainability uh, with, with our company. And uh, in, in this way, <clears throat> uh, we will protect what we built so far. Otherwise, the risk, we, we already see that in California, for example, they are moving back to plastic. Uh, we, we don't want that this will happen, you know, there are chances, you know, to using the, the new technology to, to, to utilize the bio, bio material, the bioplastic, to move in, in, the, in the proper direction. Even in terms of mask, uh, one of the key parts of my project is to have a mask that can be regenerated. Otherwise, we will create billions of masks to be disposed, which is which is a, a nonsense. On the other side, there are a lot of uh, significant advantages that we learn from, from this un unusual situation. Virtual meetings, you know, uh, are effective. <laughs> I'm meeting three, three, new, three new person, very, very interesting today. I'm working very well from home. I would like to reduce travel for my executive team, you know, of, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's important uh, uh, the cash position. Uh, I think that Carmen again again co cover cover this. You know, cash position could move the company uh, uh, to uh, forget about uh, sustainability. But this again, it's a political decision. This all the company they need the proper support not to move uh, in 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 the wrong direction that could uh, help them to survive short term, but could destroy you know everybody lives on on a long term basis yeah thank you thank you very much for for your comment julia and um, i also uh, for my, what i see here from switzerland is that although there is a lot of the um, forces that are pushing towards uh, reopening and uh, uh, going back to normal with economy and so on. Um, the government has been quite strict and it has shown actually that if, gov if the governments want something to happen, it can happen. Um, and it's the same thing with, so if they tell us to stay close indoors, we have to do it, uh, regardless of the consequences. And uh, it tells me in a way how things could be slightly differently have done about uh, sustainability as well, but uh, there wasn't any political will, most likely. Uh, Tony, how do you how do you see the the whole argument about not getting back to to verse when it comes to sustainability? I think what's interesting what you said about governments, this is also the time that they, of course, support uh, local businesses. But uh, I think it's also the time that we could uh, maybe uh, make a few changes as well. As you understand, uh, uh, the whole season is changing at the moment. Factories are closed, shops have been closed. All the stores have, are full with uh, spring summer goods, uh, which uh, Germany opened their stores last week. And Holland, uh, most stores are open again. Uh, so I think now sales will start a little bit again. Um, but we, we, will, we decided to deliver our winter goods only in August, September, October. So we, cha we change actually the whole season. And what would be great if the governments would also regu regulate more the sale period, like in Belgium, for example, they do. They have one month of sale. You can't start before and you, and you can't uh, stay after. Mm -hmm. And there's talk with the European Union at the moment, I think, to regulate this, especially this summer. It's important that people don't go into huge discounts where in the end, we all know that if there's no margin, the supplier gets paid less. So in the end, they are the weakest link in our, in our system. And if you look at salaries in, in, in developing countries or, uh, uh, or unemployment is a huge problem. So I think if, if the government would take action to this, that would, that would be amazing. Um, and then also I hope that the seasonal change will stay because our summer, I'm not, I'm not sure, also in your countries as well, and it's globally uh, with climate, climate change. Also, the winter, the winter started a lot later. And why shall we deliver winter jackets in July? Well, they stay in store till uh, the in November. Yeah. It's, it's for cash. It doesn't make any sense. And I think uh, it would be great that when winter deliveries would remain to August, uh, September, October, and summer deliveries don't start in December, but they would start in, let's say, February, March, April. That would really be a, a great permanent uh, thing. And then if the combination with regulating sale, I think that would be uh, forcing also uh, less people to buy on very low prices. And in the end, we need to pay a little bit more to 
to clean up this world and uh, buy less, but buy buy a little bit. Spend like it's, and it's not it's like our products are maybe 10, 15 percent more expensive than our non-sustainable competitors. It's it's not a huge mm. difference anymore, like it was ten years ago mm. when it was really expensive to to eco washes or to make organic fabrics. The, the difference has become a lot smaller. Um, and also what I see is like uh, what, what, what brands are doing, and I hear from colleagues as well, to make collections smaller again. Don't come with this huge collection, big sample costs. Uh, big uh, samples need to be transferred by, uh, by a uh, courier, uh, maybe one sample at a time, one lab dip at a time. And I think also, I think what uh, Julio said, I, we are also rethinking our travel behavior. I, I'm a very personal person. That's why I love to work with Italians a lot. Eh? They also do the mm -hmm. same. I sit around the table and feel together the fabric, feel the product. And that's still really important, I think, this personal part. But we also learned in this period that with Zoom or with other technology, we can also be closer together. And also, I think other innovations like 3D design or mm -hmm. prototyping, 3D prototyping, we can also save a lot of cost of samples, and, which is still, um, if I look at my company, I pay 4% of my total turnover in samples, which are kind of can, uh, losing a lot of money on it. Yeah. Uh, and next to that, I think making a collection smaller and less seasonal, I think, would also help overstock. So if you don't go in, it will also decrease sale. So we already had quite a big part of basics, but to be honest, we made our spring summer collection smaller and also mm -hmm. make uh, more uh, core basics, which are uh, on stock, uh, uh, which people can reorder. And then also yeah, keep, carry, over. Mm -hmm. carry over for, uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, about 40% uh, of our spring summer collection is, is carry over now or uh, core basics. And before that, as as a, as core, you also like to show that you, you can do crazy things with sustainable items, which we still do. The icing on the cake, we still need that. Otherwise, mm. otherwise we only can buy uh, sustainable basics, which is a lot of it out there. And, and I think also we need to address that people want to look cool and nice and buy something new sometimes. And I think, yeah, that, that will help. And I think next to that, by teaching consumers and giving them like a benchmark of what is sustainable, because it's, it's one of the most abused words, I think, in the past year, sustainability. What does it mean? No, if I go here to a shopping street, most consumers, they don't, they don't know. They don't even know the difference between organic cotton and conventional cotton. I think we in the industry, we do. Mm -hmm. And maybe a, like a small uh, part who's been eating vegan or buying an electric car, maybe they're a little bit open to this as well, but there's so much still to go. And I think there's a lot of talk that, oh, the world has changed. I don't think so. I think <laughs> the biggest part of their consumers are still unaware of what, what they do. And they need a very simple ABC, what is good and what is not mm -hmm. good. And, and, and there's no proper benchmark. There's so many certifications from uh, BS, BS uh, social certifications, uh, organic certifications, recycle certifications. I mean, uh, I think there's hundreds and I think we need to bring it back to a very simple message like uh, IMDB, uh, if you want to watch a, a movie, what, what number does it have? As simple as that, then I think we can also move. To, and, and I think every person has a good intentions, but it has to make also by the industry, it has to make it a little bit easier to, to make your, to do the right choice. And if you don't make the right choice, you make a conscious choice not, 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 not to do it. That's also fine, but that's it. And at least you give people the opportunity. And yeah. not, uh, and I think, yeah, this, this could be a good moment to do that. But I mean, I think, uh, yeah, retailers have to come through this period, brands as well. I see myself also, my business will go back 20, 20 to 25% this year, my turnover. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard time. And uh, uh, we need also need to, uh, yeah, we need to get cash flow running and need to make sure that this is going back so we can use, uh, yeah, strengthening our company and making permanent decisions to change our business model, although our business model was already pretty much in this direction. <laughs> but still, it yeah. made me, made me fine-tune it as well, because also the world is looking different. And, uh, and, and I think for quite a long time, it's not that this is over. In two months, all the stores will be hip and happening. I think this will be for the next year or years. I think uh, there will be less closed sold, and we need to prepare for that as an industry. And that also will mean several brands will be disappearing. It also means that shops will be disappearing and uh, that, uh, yeah, the, the, the strongest one will re remain. And I hope the strongest ones are also the most sustainable ones. Yeah, I think that uh, that is the hope of all of us on this call. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> yeah. Like very, very good points about uh, simplification of the system, but also about regulation, which is a very, very important uh, element in this mix. And so one closing word from, from Carmen. So Carmen, how do we ensure that uh, uh, we don't set back the sustainability efforts so far? 
Yeah, that's a really hard one, as, as Tony was saying, but I think it's really important as brands, as companies, that we keep reshaping the value chain. I think to me that's really the most important thing, to make it more transparent, more humane, and more caring for the environment. And this is a real opportunity for changes from small companies like us, which would be easier, but we are doing it, to, to really the big companies, uh, for everybody. Uh, you know, uh, we know what the consumers want, we know how they will react, but our responsibility is towards how we produce our product. I think that is really, really important. Um, and, and we are absolutely uh, confronted with really such difficult situations, but the way we have to see it, I think, is we have to see that, you know, uh, I mean, this is these times of, of critical um, crisis is also the time for transformation is the time to, to you know to open doors for these new changes and then um, reassess everything in a way you know uh, who we are what our values uh, how do we work and it's hard because you know i'm doing quite a lot of this thinking at the moment you know as as the brand ambassador as, as the founder of the company, but at the same time, you've got to really keep every little lead that comes to you, you've got to follow it. You know, our mm -hmm. team is smaller now, so we've got three times more the, the, the work that we had before. Uh, so it's this, as, as a person, you really have to be divided into the bigger picture, which is really more the, the, the world picture, the responsibility. Mm -hmm have and the individual and, and you know as part of the company that you really need to take care of your company and really make sure that we survive this and we move into this future which is now um, so I think as, as I think we all said we've got to act now I think we we are acting now and then um, put everything we have to make sure that you know uh, we can put this little bit of grain into helping the planet to, to, to change basically I think that's a, that's a really wonderful way to, to sum up our discussion today. So, Carmen, Julia, and Tony, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you very much for your, sharing your experience and, um, and insights. I, I'm sure that our audience has found it informative and stimulating. I for, for sure have. So for, for all of you watching us, um, so I'll be bringing discussions like this um, once a week uh, to our LinkedIn profile. So please follow Lumish uh, Essays LinkedIn if you want to hear more about the fashion sustainability topics in the time of crisis. Thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.